Good morning and good afternoon. His Excellency Ambassador Hargren, Director Sven Strom, prominent panelists, experts in ISDP and Nordic Benelux Center, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nordic Korea Dialogue on Peace, Development, and Cooperation. I'm Jason Lee, Director of Nordic Benelux Center and Dean of Grad School of International Studies at Korea University. This is the second Nordic Korea Dialogue event co-organized by the ISDP and Nordic Benelux Center of Korea University and supported by the Korea Foundation and John Monetary Program of the European Union. I remember the first meeting of Nordic Korea Dialogue in October 2019 at Stockholm, which was a great event that had built a strong academic and policy linkage between Korea and Nordic countries. We were supposed to have the second meeting last year, but had to postpone the event due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm thankful to the ISDP for having organized this event and continue the momentum of the dialogue process. The two regions, the Nordic and Northeast Asia, are facing a growing number of common challenges. Geopolitical competition between the US and China has accelerated and new opportunities and challenges have been raised for a safer and effective regional security architecture. On the other hand, digital revolution, climate change and energy transition have brought new common agenda for the Nordic and Northeast Asian countries. The pandemic, ironically, have accelerated the transition to the digital and the greener world. These agenda will certainly be the new pillar of bilateral and multilateral cooperation between the two parties in the future. In this sense, the two sessions of today's event are rightly covered the the common agenda we are facing now, I expect a fruitful outcome from the presentations and discussions of prominent panelists. Lastly, I cannot appreciate more the partnership between the Nordic Benelux Center and ISDP, as well as participating Nordic institution. The Nordic Benelux Center at Korea University has organized a series of lectures, seminars, and projects in which diplomats, experts, and entrepreneurs from Europe and Korea have discussed innovation, peace, and common paths toward the future. It also delivered great information and knowledge to students and researchers. I sincerely hope the collaboration in this Nordic-Korea dialogue could be expanded in the future. When the end of the pandemic opens a new door for the future, I do wish that we can get together for a more intimate meeting in an offline setting too. Now, I will turn the microphone to Director Nicholas Svenstrom of ISDP. Thank you very much. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like, of course, to thank the Nordic Benelux Center at the Korea University and, of course, Professor Jason Lee personally for our collaboration. Um, this, as was mentioned before, this is our second uh, round of Nordic uh, Korea dialogue. We had a very successful first meeting in Stockholm in 2019. And, uh, well, despite the pandemic, we're very happy we can do this uh, again. But of course, uh, in the future, we also hope that we can do it in Seoul. And uh, especially during these trying times in Sweden, when we have still a bit chilly, we would like to come to, to Seoul. Um, but I, and I think that, and I believe uh, that the Nordic Korea dialogue will continue. And there's my firm hope that we will have a much more institutionalized, institutionalized dialogue uh, and an academic hub between Nordic region and Korea. And I, you know, it's our firm belief that this dialogue we have created will be a platform to bridge the Nordic and uh, 
uh, Northeast Asian region in the future. So we see this as a stepping stone and a very important one. Uh, as was already mentioned, um, Nordic countries in South Korea face many similar security challenges, and not least under the US-China rivalry and, and geopolitical competition. Um, I think the Nordic countries in, in uh, South Korea share many common values, such as democratic system, human rights, the willingness to develop green development, but also gender equality and, uh, and the rule of law. And uh, so I, I think that um, this really puts us on a very similar footing. And of course, you know, we, we do have the geopolitical challenges, but we also has been exposed to Chinese pressure both and a large amount of Chinese disinformation campaigns, etc. And I think that there's a lot to learn from each other and how we deal with this. But I also think it's on a positive note, I think the Nordic interest in the in engaging in peace on the Korean Peninsula has actually grown quite significantly. And all of this really provides a platform for strengthening cooperation with, between the Nordic countries and South Korea. I, I also think in the past, maybe the geographical distance and the lack of communication information between the two regions, and let's see, well, the Nordic region and South Korea, uh, have not really been able to create a stronger cooperation, but you know, but I think with increased interest in learning from it, about each other and from each other, and also thanks to the dig digital technology, like today's virtual meeting, uh, our intellectual distance will be reduced. So for me, I think it's absolutely fundamental that despite the pandemic, we were been able to continue the Nordic Korea dialogue. And I, and I, as I said, I hope that we will be able to meet both in Seoul and in the Nordic region in the future. But with that, I will stop and I will just say that I'm looking forward to our discussion and I'm looking forward to learning from you today. So Dr. Lee, I think the, uh, the floor is yours. Or will I turn over to Jacob directly? Ambassador Halgren? Yes, please, Ambassador Helgren. Well, then I would just quickly just introduce uh, this. We have the pleasure of having uh, the Swedish Ambassador um, Jakob Halgren uh, as opening up the first session. Um, he is actually um, a person I had the pleasure of working quite a long time with and known for quite a bit. And I think that when we're talking about increasing uh, uh, information uh, and learning and, and sort of building that relationship. Um, I do not know many more people than uh, 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 Ambassador Halgen who is in the academic world and he has one foot in, uh, uh, in the diplomacy. So I think we've been very fortunate to have him here today. So Ambassador Halgen, the floor is yours. Uh, Niklas uh, Sonström, thank you so very much for those kind words of, of introduction and, uh, and also thank you to Professor Lee Jae-sung at the, at the uh, Nordic Benelux Center at Korea University. Uh, it's really my pleasure to, to join you here today. Uh, as uh, Niklas just said, uh, I've been serving here in Korea as the ambassador for about three or soon three years, and it's really my my uh, it's been my pleasure to to work with actually both of your institutions. Uh, I've given several speeches already at the Nordic Benelux Center, and as Niklas said, uh, in my previous time at at Cipri, we had uh, many challenges and and exchanges. Uh, so so that was. Uh, that was, uh, it, it's great to, to be able to, to participate in this forum with, with both of you as so. So thank you for, for doing this, first of all. It's really, it means a lot that you're bridging 
our two uh, academic and intellectual communities together. And I do think this is a great initiative uh, to pursue now, as you mentioned, this, the second time this Nordic Korea uh, joint uh, dialogue on peace development and, and cooperation. There's so much to dig into. There are so many commonalities and, and, uh, and, and things to further expand in our joint uh, relationship. So this first session um, of, of two will, will focus, as you've seen from the invitation, of the, on the future of, of security in the uh, Nordic region and in Korea and when, what joint challenges we might have and uh, what we might learn from each other's uh, strategic and political landscapes. Uh, we have four distinguished and very interesting speakers. I'll try to cut my speaking because I would like to listen to, to you. But what we will delve and, and look into a little bit further, what we will explore is, of course, how the Sino American rivalry affects us both in different ways, as both uh, um, as both previous speaker just uh, alluded uh, to. Obviously, this affects uh, strategic and political debates in the whole world. But uh, I think we have uh, similarities. Being peninsula in either end of the Eurasian uh, continent, uh, we might have some ch similar challenges. Uh, and, and I will be so curious to hear uh, from the different speakers how our two regions have dealt with these challenges, because of course there are commonalities, but there are also differences, and what can we learn? And, and another question is, of course, as was mentioned is in, in the introduction, I mean, we have a lot of common values, and how can we leverage that, whether it's democracy, human rights, rule of law, uh, I, by the way, gave a speech on human rights at, at the Nordic Benelux Center a couple of years ago. And not least, how do we promote uh, peaceful and sustainable uh, solutions? Uh, how can the Nordic countries participate usefully or uh, promote or facilitate the, the Korea Peninsula peace process? Very hot issue. We have a summit coming up this week only in Washington that many are uh, curious about. And another very important question uh, is the regional mechanisms and institutions. We have quite uh, a few of them in Europe. Most of them are working. Some, uh, you know, maybe not so good, but they are there. Uh, Northeast Asia is a region with much fewer regional mechanisms and institutions. So, so what's the uh, similarities and, and differences and how can we maybe get inspired by each other? So as I said, we have uh, four uh, speakers. Uh, I will introduce them each in detail when uh, they start to speak. But uh, first we have Professor Hewon Jun from the National, um, Korea National Diplomatic uh, Academy. So, uh, we have uh, Mayor General Mats Engman from ISTP. We have Professor Jung Kyu Kim from Aju University. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Niklas Wallström, director of ISTP. Uh, and now, after this technical glitch, we have maybe 90 minutes or uh, a little bit less. Now maybe we have 70 minutes, 70, 80 minutes to, to go. We will end this session at uh, 6.30 here in Seoul, 10.30 in, in Stockholm. Uh, after each presentation, I'll take the privilege to maybe put one question. Uh, but then uh, we'll open up for both discussion between speakers and we'll also, I'd also be happy to take questions which will uh, arrive uh, uh, from you who are listening to this uh, in the audience. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to start with Professor Hewon Jun. You are uh, a professor at the Korea National Dil uh, Diplomatic uh, Academy. Uh, you are uh, uh, an expert of European politics, the European uh, Union, NATO, uh, etc. And, and you have a DPhil and a Master of Science from, from Oxford. That's, uh, that's uh, quite interesting. So uh, could I please ask you to uh, deliver your speech and keep it to a bit less than maybe 10 minutes and then we'll uh, take some question and, and uh, continue. So please, uh, Professor Yoon, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, good. Uh, yeah, uh, the most important part of my presentation is uh, on my slide one. The views expressed in this presentation are those of my mind and not you know, part of uh, I finance KND and the Korean government. So now I can safely say as a person, not a representative of the government. Uh, my presentation is about the Europe's Indo-Pacific strategy and how that changes Cor uh, Korea's strategy positioning. Yeah. Uh, uh, first, uh, I have to say a little bit about the Europe's pivot to Asia since nine, uh, 2018. Uh, as you know, the European countries have been rapidly establishing their Indo-Pacific strategies. These include those of France, which is uh, published the, around the three papers in May uh, in 2019. Uh, France has been focusing m um, uh, mainly on the uh, on the traditional security issues, but includes others. And Germany, uh, which is uh, titled their Indo-Pacific strategy, not strategy, but policy guideline, and which was published in September last year, and Netherlands, uh, November last year, and the most recent to the European Union uh, last month, so is, uh, published their Council conclusions. And then at the end of the Council conclusions on the Indo-Pacific, they said that they are going to have a more concrete policy rec uh, action plan uh, later this year. Uh, what this means, what this European people to Asia means to Korea. The European approaches vary in terms of contents, rhetoric, and policy areas. Uh, especially uh, the way to give into security issues uh, are very different. Uh, as I told you, France, which is uh, claiming as in the Pacific country because they have territory in this region, uh, is uh, heavily uh, emphasizing the military security part, whereas uh, uh, Germany is much more cautious on the, uh, that path and then emphasizing more on the economic uh, aspect of the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, in case of the Netherlands, I think uh, they emphasize economy, but also emphasize importance of NATO. But all these approaches has three things in common, I think. The first one is importance of the European Union. So the three countries led to the European Un uh, Union approach. And the Second one is, uh, which is also part of our discussion today, is a concern for rise of China and uh, the instability of the region. But I'm saying this is uh, said implicitly or explicitly because in case of France, uh, it is more critical about China's rise and uh, its, uh, its uh, influence over the regional instability. But in case of Germany, Germany tried to be very careful not to directly ch uh, mention China on anything negative in their policy guidelines. And uh, thirdly, uh, all these uh, four strategies of uh, uh, France, Germany, Netherlands, and the EU uh, uh, emphasize the importance of multipolarity, saying that it's not a choice between the US and China, but the world should be multipolarity and then Europe should be one of the polars. Uh, so that's the common thing. Uh, European countries or European Union are not the only European force uh, talk about in the Pacific uh, regions. NATO, although it's a transatlantic uh, organization, not just the European uh, organization, is also talk, start to talk about in the Pacific issues. So firstly, in, the, in NATO's history, uh, in its uh, London Summit Declaration, NATO mentions that the China's growing influence and internal policies present both opportunities and the challenges. So this is kind of compromise uh, for uh, the allies, which is uh, uh, China's reaction carefully. And November last year, uh, in preparation for the NATO's new strategic concern, there was expert uh, report, uh, which is titled NATO 2030. Here, uh, it emphasized the reason why NATO should include China's rise as important to uh, significant uh, strategic environment to change, and then NATO should address uh, China's rise as well. 
And uh, maybe the third point would be a bit, uh, looks a bit small, but I think it's significant. Last year, again, June, uh, NATO Japan Individual Partnership and Cooperation Program of, were updated. There, they include the, the phrase saying NATO may consider contributing assets to Japanese exercise in the Pacific region, where NATO participation would be appropriate. This is a big change from the NATO's previous approach, which is saying, well, NATO is not coming to this part of the world. They, they have changed their attitude. Interesting part is that in NATO's uh, I, uh, individual partnership and cooperation program with Australia doesn't include this kind of phrase. This is included, as far as I'm concerned, only with the Japan IPCP. And the lastly, uh, NATO became more uh, specific about this involvement with the Asian partners, uh, i.e. Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, because the four partners participated for the first time in NATO foreign minister meeting. And the ministers, uh, the topic of the meeting was on shifting the global balance of power and explicitly the rise of China. And then they discussed that with the four Asian Pacific partners as well as the Finland, Sweden, European Union. So the Europe is certainly pivoting to Asia. It's not just about talk, another aspect, is a military corporate Europe's military cooperation in uh, this year, uh, which is happening uh, uh, in this part of the world again. So uh, at the moment, the, there is a first joint of Japan, France, and US uh, military exercise in Japan. But later, this uh, Australia is going to join it. Uh, uh, this month as well. And uh, this is first to for uh, Japan, France and the US drills, but I should emphasize you that UK has uh, has already uh, part, uh, organized an exercise with Japan in Japan. And then also there has been exercise between Japan, UK and the US uh, uh, some time uh, ago. Then another activity is the UK carrier strike group led by HMS Queen Elizabeth is coming to the Pacific for the six uh, through Middle East and up to here is about, I, th I think uh, it's the uh, five months tour. And the Germany for the first time is sending its frigate to, to Hamburg as well. So what all this movement from uh, Europe means for China, uh, for, sorry, for Korea. Such movement is changing the security environment to Korea rapidly, even though Korea has been defeated between the US and China with a kind of implicit sense of strategic ambiguity. Well, it may be new for Europe to face challenges to choose between the US and China, uh, but this is not new for Korea. This is all the news for Korea. We haven't done, you know, we have been faced with this uh, at least uh, once China opened their market in 1990s. But uh, I should have emphasized that uh, Korea has this old experience of challenge between choosing between the US and China has uh, uh, actually mixing experience. Under the shadow of economic, uh, economic uh, retaliation from China, Korea has faced the challenges to pursue three things. One is a value-based diplomacy, second, the enhanced peaceful solution for Korean Peninsula, because uh, China uh, believed to have influence over North Korea and enhanced its own security with the US-Korea uh, alliance at the same time. These three things are not easy to mix, especially when it comes to with the uh, interdependency uh, on the Chinese market. Uh, so how Korea has done that so far? Uh, this is, I, I uh, intentionally chose the research from Chong Yin Moon, uh, who is a special advisor for the current administration for many uh, years. Uh, in his work, he chose three cases. First one is Thad, second is AIAB, and the third one is South China Sea. So the first case, Thad, is about security. Here, the current government chose the US. And the second one, AIIB, which is economy, the current government chose, uh, current government chose uh, uh, China. And the thirdly, uh, when it comes to South China Sea, it's more about 
I think value-based diplomacy, they chose the neutral positions. That's what, how we have conducted so far. So why, uh, why this is uh, the, the people, uh, this uh, attitude is under pressure, partly because of Europe's uh, uh, people to Asia, uh, because Korea has never exercised, in my opinion, value-based diplomacy against China. Yes, it upholds values in its diplomacy. Yes, it believes, uh, you know, democracy, human rights, uh, etc. But when it comes to China, it's all about power politics. So Korea has, uh, uh, so we have no experience of uh, upholding uh, value-based uh, diplomacy against China uh, and then also we have never really experienced how to deal with the economic retaliation from China. We gave in for, on the first case and the second case we just uh, suffered. The first experience is the so-called Great Garlic War in 2000, year 2000. Sorry, uh, we have announced the COVID-19. Uh, just to have a yeah, I, I cannot stop this. Uh, and I told my office, but, uh, sorry. Uh, so we are serious, of course. That's okay. Maybe you can, you can try to wrap up slowly, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. so we have uh, this uh, great garlic war and uh, we just uh, suffered and we gave in and the details are in this uh, slide. And second one is a start that here, we didn't remove the flood, but our economic damage was really heavy from China. So what this means, the Europe's increasing secret engagement in the Pacific region, especially Northeast Asia is making Korea's strategy ambiguity more and more difficult to maintain. Why? Because the uh, European approaches so far, I think, has three things. Economically open strategy economy, according to European Union, politically value-based diplomacy like uh, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and security-wise is uh, through traditional uh, transatlantic alliance. But for Korea, how we could, uh, we the Europeans coming to a uh, in the Pacific is not a choice between U.S. and China anymore. How we could uh, uh, reconcile our strategic ambiguity with the Europe's value-based diplomacy and then uh, transatlantic alliance, to, you know, interested in the Indo-Pacific uh, security is, uh, thing uh, uh, issues as well. So. Uh, we may find the uh, examples from the European economy and the security wise uh, things that we wouldn't, uh, uh, we would be, we would find it difficult to involve uh, European exercise with the Japan, U US uh, without provoking China. I but I think the more important part is we have to show what we believe in our diplomacy. So the the second part, value-based diplomacy, we haven't tried with China, and then Europeans are think, uh, more and more focusing on uh, uh, to find like-minded countries like Korea, Ch uh, Japan, and other countries, uh, Australia, and we haven't, Korea hasn't figured out how to address this because we have no experience with China in that regard. Uh, so in this sense, I think uh, I would conclude that strategic dialogue between Korea and Europe is needed more than ever. So far, our, we have a lot of dialogues with the European countries and European Union and even with the NATO, but I think uh, so far we have been, it's not really strategies about talking about global goods and then by interest, that's it. But I think it's time for us seriously talking about how we address these issues, not each other's interest, but actually our shared strategic interest and how to reconcile our value-based uh, diplomacy with the uh, economic retaliation from China. Uh, and uh, at this point, I think Korea, uh, the prospect of a Korean presidential election is very important because it will be happening in 2022. And then usually Korea's strategic positioning changes over uh, administration changes. And in this case, I think Korea is at the crossroad to 
make diplomacy as a liberal democracy. I think I, I wrap up here. Yeah. Professor Yun, thank you so very much for this extremely interesting uh, uh, scene setter. Uh, you're both touching at a couple of very important points, and I think educate us all uh, in, in how this, uh, uh, I fully agree, strategic ambiguity is, is uh, uh, carried out here in, 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 in Korea. You were saying that that is going to be more difficult to, to maintain and the strategic dialogue with Europe is needed. I'm very curious, but I, I am a little bit mindful of time, so I will not put a question to you now, but I'd like to revert to that in, in, in the debate, how, how you think Korea should clarify a, 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 its position here. I mean, I think all of us Korea watchers are acutely aware of the predicament that Korea actually, uh, you know, is in with uh, the proximity geographically and dependence trade-wise, etc., of China, while clearly, uh, you know, legally belonging to the, to the, uh, to, I mean, in, in, in a strong uh, uh, defense and security alliance with with the U.S. is, is so many years. So, so when you're saying that the strategic ambiguity is maybe overdue and and, and difficult to maintain. I'd like to come back to that in the discussion, uh, what needs to happen or what might actually have to happen uh, in, in, and what maybe the dangers are of not clarifying uh, uh, positions. But as I said, I'm a little bit mindful of time and I am to blame because I started by messing up. So uh, I'd, I'd actually like to turn to our next uh, speaker and, uh, you know, ladies first and then uh, Korean, Swedish every, every second time. Uh, so our next uh, speaker is no less than Major General Matt Sengman, uh, great, great uh, friend, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic career, and lots of very, very important uh, um, experiences. You are currently a st distinguished military fellow at the ISDP, but you of course have a long and very distinguished career in the Swedish Armed Forces, which was. Uh, wrapped up as uh, the Swedish member of the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission between uh, 2015 and 17. So you actually left just before I came and I learned a lot from you after having also met you in various interesting meetings in the, the auspices of, 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 of CIPRI where I were uh, before. And, and your focus is, uh, as you might know if you don't, in the audience, security policy, military strategy, crisis management, and I know that you're also focusing a lot on risk reduction and, uh, and regional institutions and, and, and instruments. So, so Max, with the, no further ado, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and great to see you again, uh, Jacob. Um, I've labeled my, my short introduction navigating big power big power rivalry, and I will try to make some um, comparison between the situation in Northern Europe, the Nordics, and uh, on the, in East Asia, and see, try to deduct, maybe asking the question, what to do moving ahead. So first, the, the strategic context in, in, in where I live and work uh, for most of my uh, years. Um, so during the Cold War, and now having returned, in fact, Northern Europe has become what I would term a battleground for big power rivalry. We are witnessing intensifying military exercises, increasing military buildup on both sides, the West slash NATO and Russia, including in Sweden. Nuclear deterrence strategy is an important part of this strategic picture. And among the Nordics, countries made different security policies, both in the beginning of the Cold War and as uh, time progressed. Sweden and Finland opted for a military non-allied policy, but over time, closer and closer cooperation with NATO. Denmark and Norway became NATO members, but with restrictions on their membership. No permanent stationing of US troops, no nuclear weapons allowed, etc. But in parallel to this competitive security environment, strong efforts were made to promote the rule of law, Thank you. 
the European Union, and more recently, the Joint Expeditionary Force, which is a Northern Europe initiative. And I think this is very important, and a myriad of sub-organizations with special, more limited mandates and tasks. And one very important consideration during the build-up, where I was part of negotiating some of these in, in Vienna, um, and also an important lessons learned in Europe is that one size does not fit all. You need diversity. You need a variety of instruments and institutions to tackle a difference and over time changing security and military related challenges. Over to Asia. If we turn our eyes towards East Asia and the Korean Peninsula, we have some very many similarities, but also, as mentioned, differences. We have a similar situation in East Asia being a battleground for big power rivalry of intensifying military exercises, of military buildup on all sides, of nuclear deterrence being an important part of the strategic picture. Dr. Sang Su, who is with us today, in a recent article in, in 38 North stated, and I quote, what we are witnessing today on the Korean Peninsula is the same kind of action-reaction dynamic, dynamic that developed between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, a destabilizing and expensive arms race that prompted both sides to pursue arms control agreements to promote strategic stability, reduce arms racing, and lessen the burden of defense expenditures, end of quote. What is different is the overall security architecture in East Asia, where bilateral security arrangements are the norm. The US Republic of Korea uh, alliance, the US Japan alliance, the US Philippine and China, North Korea. But still all of these have some restrictions. No permanent deployment of troops in the Philippines at the moment no permanent deployment of nuclear weapons in South Korea and Japan, and also temporary halting of some military exercises between the alliance partners. And another difference in the almost total lack of collective arrangement to reduce and manage risks, collective efforts to promote confidence and security building measures, and arms controls efforts and or agreements. Before moving over to looking into the future, I think I need to say a few words of uh, overall security environment development, because I think this is critical as we are in a kind of crossroad. Uh, I was lucky to listen to a recent interview uh, by Sir General Nick Carter, the uh, UK Chief of Defence, and he said, I quote, the world has never been more complex, generated by a combination of big power competition, failing states, and extremism. End of quote. All of which is also underpinned by a fast evolving technological change that combined even requires rethinking strategic deterrence. What we also are witnessing is more of what I would call political warfare where blurring of lines between private and public, between business and government, between kinetic and non-kinetic, between military and civilian is a key feature. International norms and standards are not being accepted. They are challenged. The use of proxies and mercenaries are returning and gray zone operations, that is operations under the threshold of war and deniability, are becoming the norm. So all of this in one word and one conclusion for me drives that partnerships is becoming more important. I would argue that we need to better understand and navigate in this fast changing security environment where escalation management is becoming much more difficult. I'm thinking of space and cyber, for instance, and deterrence, as I said, needs an overhaul. By widening the cooperative framework between like-minded nations. But we need to do this in a transparent manner, 
with the overarching objective of improving predictability and risk management. Republic of Korea is one of the leading democracies in East Asia and a strong promoter of the rule of law, United Nations Charter, and international norms and regulation, and is well-placed to assume a leading role in this field. The Nordics could offer our experience on how to develop a more collective security architecture, ultimately benefiting not only the Republic of Korea, but the wider Asia region. We do not have the, all the right answers, but our experience and the general security environment has enough similarities with the situation in East Asia to make such an effort worth pursuing. Possible areas of cooperation could be sharing of lessons learned from negotiations and implementations, building confidence and transparency by introducing meeting for us and institutions. And I give you as an example, um, the Arctic chief of defense meetings where Russia was, was part of the table, develop risk management procedures, introducing a more inclusive and regular security dialogue, etc. Sweden in particular and the Republic of Korea could also engage in more defense-related cooperation, including in fields of peace support operation, demining, and even defense industry cooperation to stimulate innovation. Quick conclusion. Geographically apart, but there are many similarities between the Nordic region and East Asia, and the Nordics can offer experience, lessons learned, and be a facilitator in collective security related issues. With the current US administration more engaged in alliance building, an incremental approach towards a more collective security framework in Asia may now be possible. Thank you. Uh, Matt, thank you so very much for those uh, reflections. Uh, I think it was extremely interesting to hear your description of how tensions are actually growing quite a lot in the Nordic region as well, and how that makes the Nordic region in, in a way more similar, even if it's not a desired development, it makes the Nordic region more similar to, to the Northeast Asia uh, region. And as mid-sized or smallish uh, players, the need for, for partnerships and, and, uh, and actually looking at our each other experiences and uh, how we can learn and maybe even sharing from from uh, each other's experiences uh, so i mean that's 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 very very interesting i will be curious to hear your further thoughts about how that could maybe be leveraged or or, or implemented uh, i mean you said that uh, no one size fits uh, fits all and that's definitely uh, true but but uh, as you since You've spent several years in, in both contexts. It would be interesting to hear you developing uh, that. But um, I, I think I will actually continue in the, in the interest of time. And then we, we save uh, this, this. Please remember those questions. And then we will get back mm -hmm. to that uh, very, very soon, uh, Mats. And, and I'd like to continue the, the presentations. We have two eminent speakers uh, left. So, uh, with your permission, I would like to continue with uh, Professor Kim uh, Chongju. Uh, you are at the Aju University at the Department of, of Political uh, Science. And uh, you are an expert of uh, Chinese security and foreign policy and international relations in, in, in Northeast Asia. So, it will be interesting to hear your presentation, maybe also reflecting on, on what Matt Sengman uh, just uh, said, uh, you have a, a DPhil from uh, from the University of Oxford and and also a Master of uh, Science in International Relations from Seoul National uh, University, and you're also actually involved in in Blue House uh, committees on on future visions on on the um, security context here in 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 the region. Uh, so please, uh, Professor Kim, could I ask you to take the floor? Okay, uh, thank you very much. The, um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, good morning for the ISDP people and then um, uh, Director Nicholas uh, uh, Swanstone and then good afternoon for my Korean colleagues, including Professor Lee jae uh, I appreciate uh, your readership, both of you. 
And then I am very much delighted to always join this dialogue. And then uh, I re it really reminds me of my pleasant staying at the ISDP uh, in Stockholm in uh, February 2020, uh, just before the uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, throughout the world. So uh, I always uh, ha has, uh, have a dream to go back to uh, your you know, institute and then uh, you know, uh, I become an avid supporter for uh, Nordic and Korea dialogue, as well as the uh, you know, better relationship between uh, South Korea and uh, Sweden. Uh, let me briefly introduce the uh, uh, history of uh, uh, Korea and then also the uh, uh, South Korea's uh, foreign policy orientation uh, in the year of uh, uh, you know, uh, US-China strategic uh, competition. And then also the, uh, 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 my uh, feeling of uh, you know, uh, how we uh, strengthen the uh, you know, cooperation between the uh, South Korea and uh, Sweden. Uh, Korea has uh, long faced uh, one of the worst uh, geopolitical environments uh, similar to Poland in Eastern Europe. It has been a bridge between the continental and maritime powers, uh, subjecting to uh, the military invasion. Uh, uh, throughout Korean history, uh, Korea has been uh, subject to the uh, coercive pressure and invasions from rising great powers whenever there were a great power confrontation and the power transition uh, in this region. There was no exception to escape from such tragic uh, you know, outcomes. Uh, currently, uh, South Korea faced the most serious and uh, systemic uh, strategic competition in the 21st century between the United States and China. Uh, in the perspective of geopolitics, Robert uh, Kaplan succinctly point out uh, such situation of Korea. Korea is in a, in a shattered zone. According to the Korean scholar Ryu Bong Young, uh, Korea has been invaded by outside forces uh, 931 times uh, in history. Uh, among them, uh, 438 times from the north. Uh, mostly major invasions came from north, it means, and because most of the uh, southern invasions. Uh, comprised of the non-state liberal pirates from uh, Japan. It really tells us that there, it's been unreserved questions throughout history for Koreans to find a kind of a panacea uh, to deal with uh, China. Since the uh, public announcement of the national security uh, strategy on China as a strategic competitor in uh, 2017, the United States has sophisticated is China strategy uh, uh, strategies. Uh, the Biden administration is still reviewing, uh, in my view, uh, its strategy and policies toward China. Uh, they often emphasize the three C's word uh, in the nature of uh, their China policies, competition, cooperation, uh, confrontation. However, nobody is sure of uh, the end state of the US-China strategic competition uh, having in mind in the uh, Biden ad administration. Uh, Dr. Chang Li, Brookings Institute, uh, point out a new anti-China Cold War is imminent. And the United States has sought a Cold War-like block. A ruthless competition is ahead of us. Biden himself has emphasized that steep competition defines uh, US-China relations. Under Biden administration's scientific and technological uh, areas from uh, you know, biometrics and semiconductors, AI, robots, cyber, quantum communications, and two space uh, became the key battlegrounds beyond the traditional security areas. South Korea has been the staunch ally uh, of the United States and also developed a strategic cooperative partnership with China. It heavily depends on security to the United States because it faces an existential threat from North Korea's growing nuclear weapon capabilities. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the economy uh, depends on China for about 34% of its trade as of 2020 neither the United States nor China uh, can replace the role of the other for South Korea. Some of critics point out that Moon Jae-in's uh, policies lean toward the pro-China position, 
However, these arguments are neither reliable nor uh, you know, objective as far as I know. Uh, Moon Jae-in's foreign policy orientation certainly placed priority on uh, you know, ROC-US uh, alliance as documented in Moon Jae-in's 100 policy plans. His policies have never been spun out of uh, the uh, you know, boundary of the US policies related to North Korea. However, it is also true at the heart of this dilemma South Korea faces uh, pursuing a greater uh, foreign policy autonomy exists, seeking to minimize the detrimental uh, impacts from great power politics by improving relationship with North Korea. China has been a major ally and supplier for uh, economic assistance to uh, North Korea. China also has capacity to in inflict uh, serious damages to South Korea's economy, threat its security, and to uh, frustrate South Korea's aspiration for unification. Uh, so uh, Moon Jae-in uh, governments and then pays respect to the current strategic cooperative partnership with China to avoid overly antagonizing Beijing as well. However, deepening and sophisticated strategy competition cannot help forcing South Korea to choose sides in key areas, as I mentioned, such as semiconductors, upgrading missile defense system, and cyber digital you know, uh, economy, and then also other technological supply chains. As the US-China conflict uh, heats up, uh, South Korea needs to establish the uh, you know, directions of its national uh, strategy and preparing for the aggravation of the US-China technological war and the possibility of decoupling in uh, key areas. South Korea would definitely strengthen its technological uh, you know, cooperation uh, with the United States forming a new supply chain, uh, although it would seek to maintain trades and cooperation with China in non-strategic areas. The other new area for cooperation uh, with the United States is energy sector. Uh, South Korea finds the United States as the most uh, you know, uh, reliable and secure uh, source uh, for uh, su uh, supply of the energies. South Korea has already become number one uh, buyer, uh, buyers uh, of, uh, for the US produced uh, shale gas. Energy cooperation became a new source for strengthening alliance as well. Major and middle countries in Europe has long been at the center of great power politics. The transition, uh, the transatlantic coalition has also uh, determined the international politics for long. South Korea has never been at the center of the world politics. In the year of the US-China uh, strategy competition, however, the US hegemony, as well as the transatlantic coalition has waned. We are not sure of what kind of world order as the end state of this strategy competition emerges. Uh, we have a serious concern and apprehension of the world as a consequence of the Chinese rise. Rebuilding a world order is inevitable. Uh, European experience of collective corporations are very precious to South Korea. For South Korea, the competition opened the window to re-evaluate uh, relations with European uh, middle powers, such as the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany, and Denmark and Sweden, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which are uh, capable of uh, placing their voices in the world politics and then uh, you know, plant for experience in building the uh, collective corporations. South Korea hopes to take its contribution and responsibility more actively to the world. Uh, South Korea and Sweden can be natural partners as middle powers in the era of uh, you know, US-China strategy competition. The strategy competition is like a chicken's game. And no one is able to uh, you know, concede in the game. So the, to deal with this uh, strategic competition, we need the rule of third party uh, to provide a space for restraints and balancing and intermediation between these two gigantic you know, countries. I suggest the constructing the cooperation uh, and coalition among middle powers as an access to enlarge the role of intermediation. It is necessary to secure an existential space for small and middle powers in the new era of uh, uh, bipolar strategy competition in the world. The third parties may have the potential to create a new value chain against the US and China strategy competition, but not necessarily an alternative. 
uh, but uh, maybe complementary uh, you know, contribution as well. European middle powers possess a long history and experience and culture and wisdom in great power politics game. So once they established a new you know, international order uh, with the United States, now uh, we need their active you know, positive roles in constructing new inclusive world order in the year of uh, US-China strategic competitions. Uh, that's what uh, I really uh, hope to see uh, from the uh, wisdom of the European uh, countries. Uh, I sincerely hope that the uh, you know, South Korea and uh, Sweden can work together in the future uh, for a long, long time. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Kim, for, for uh, that uh, presentation. I think you laid out in a in a very articulate and, and, and compelling way the, the challenges of the strategic competition that we're seeing on the global stage and everything that that entails and how uh, Korea probably knows uh, better than anyone else what it, what it is and what, it, what, what happens when you are squeezed uh, uh, between those two increasingly protectionist and maybe nationalist uh, uh, giants. Uh, and uh, I also, I've heard several times before that quote of being invaded 931 times. It's, it's true that you, as a country, probably draw some uh, uh, strategic conclusions uh, uh, from, from, from that. Uh, uh, and I also very much like your, your uh, twist here and your comments and conclusions at the end that that, I mean, Korea in this strategic neighborhood remains, of course, a, a, a middle power. And uh, given the you know, sometimes quite tough atmosphere in this part of the world, I've also seen clearly how there is a natural uh, affinity between Korea and, and the EU and EU member states or European uh, partners. There are things to to build on there, I'm, I'm sure, and I'd, I'd love to explore that a little bit more in our in our further uh, uh, discussions. Uh, new inclusive world order, yeah, isn't that what we had in the 1990s? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it would be uh, interesting to to see uh, hear you uh, talk about how we could uh, get back to to something uh, uh, like that. Maybe focusing on some of the values we talked about early in at our session to today uh, I, I i will continue uh, as, as i said not putting a question to you directly in order to have some time for for a discussion uh, afterwards uh, and uh, because i would like to give the floor to our last speaker niklas swanstrom uh, director of, of uh, icp uh, and a very prolific both writer and commentator uh, about the Korean Peninsula, China, and, and the strategic issues with uh, with with, uh, with China, U.S., and, and how you uh, how the EU and European countries are, are part of that. You have several important affiliations apart from being the director of ISTP, including with, with the Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies and the Italian Institute for International Political uh, Studies. Uh, uh, and you have your academic background is at the Uppsala University, where you have a DPhil and PC Coffee study. And you're actually a, a co founder of, of the ISTP. Uh, so you go way back on these uh, questions. And I know, Niklas, that you will focus a little bit on uh, the Nordic countries' role uh, when it comes to the promotion of peace and peaceful outcomes in the in the Northeast Asia region. So, Niklas, please, the floor is, is yours for reflections on this. And Thank other you things. very much. Thank you very much. I'll actually try to be very brief. Uh, so I will try to cut uh, the, my presentations into the, the minimum so we can have uh, uh, a bit of discussion uh, when we go along. But as you said, I, I will try to, to look at the, the Nordics as a um, actor on, on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I'm going to focus a bit more on the, in, in, in the, for the issue of time, also on the think tanks, what they can do and how can they provide. Uh, 
I think they're often very high expectations of the Nordic states, both in Pyongyang and in Seoul, um, but also, of course, in the United States, uh, but also maybe also in the Nordic capitals. I mean, both as a go between a new, neutral platform and uh, often as seen as a, a potential actor for resolving a conflict. And I think, you know, we who work with in the Korean Peninsula realize the resolution is far, far in the future. Uh, but I think the high expectations might not be the only challenge. I think the challenge is really that the expectation often very far apart. Um, the US, RK, DPK, China, et cetera, their expectation of what the Nordics can do is not aligned. And I think that's also very much connected to the fact that there's a lack of common understanding how to move forward on the Korean Peninsula. And you know what each step is worth. What is a denuclearization worth? What is the lifting of sanction worth, et cetera? And that, that actually comes into where I think the Nordics can actually play a role. Um, but I think it's good. I mean, we have no geopolitical interest. We're not a threat. Um, but we do have strong opinions on nuclear issues, human rights, humanitarian aid. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into this, but of course, the Swedish uh, uh, government, uh, sw the Swedish foreign ministry or Swedish government, we have had an embassy in, uh, we would have the only Western embassy in Pyongyang up to 2001, I think it was. Um, which has enabled Sweden to represent the number of governments and assist. And as um, Matt's former job as the Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission, Sweden was a partner since 53. That has really given a uh, lot of, well, maybe Sweden in particular, but the Nordics in general, uh, a platform to stand on as a neutral actor and somebody who is function as a go-between. I think it's important, I'm gonna step over to think tanks now, to realize that there's a myth, I think, that DPRK and scholars from DPRK, which is of course governmentally, governmentally affiliated, is not interested in participation in different activities. I mean, we have two North Korean scholars coming this week to ISDP. And uh, there's, I think what the Nordics can actually provide is, well, informal discussions removed from the political level, uh, a platform for exchanges, exploratory dialogues, which is pretty much the same, in an effort for building roadmaps and how we can do and actually start discussing what is the value because um, we tend to end up when we reach maybe the hot temper of the Koreans, uh, when the South Koreans and North Koreans come in to get the same room, they want to move very quickly, they want to move forward and they want to find a resolution. And I think what the Nordics can provide is that platform for exchange and research. Um, but I think it also, we need to have realistic expectations. This is a, first of all, the Nordics are a small fish in a very big pond. The United States and China, of course, is the two main actors. And uh, apart from the Koreas, of course. Um, and I think also great power competition will impact what the Nordics can do on the Korean Peninsula and what can happen on the Korean Peninsula negatively. I think we have to be a bit realistic. There's been a lot of critique, I think, from the Korean side that uh, the, the Nordics has been too careful, too slow and too bureaucratic. Uh, but I think also that might actually be good in certain cases. Um, but I think it's one of the things that we are really good at, and I think that Sweden maybe is a good example of that, is maintaining a link and a channel between DPRK and outside world, both official and unofficial, when going gets really, really tough. And I think that link is extremely important. So here I think the Nordics do play a, uh, an important role. 
but I think it's it's it really is important for us to to realize also that the Nordic states um, only can do as much as we we're allowed to do by all parties involved. And I, you know, there's there's really not a big problem in expanding cooperation, expanding research. I, you know, lack of funding is is mostly the problem, which we all all scholars know. That uh, the challenge is really to get the financial capacity to do things, but the willingness is there. Then we can always debate how sincere that is. That is a valid question, but engagement is definitely possible. And I would like to stress this, at a time when the North-South dialogue is problematic, or for example, a DPRK-US dialogue is problematic, the Nordics do function as a very sort of useful platform. But of course, I don't think that that's going to lead to resolution, and I don't think the Nordics is going to be part of resolution. We're not a part of the conflict, but we can definitely provide that useful platform. And I will stop there, and I will just stop with seven minutes, and then maybe have a, a few minutes for discussion. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, uh, for those reflections. So we. Uh, moved away from uh, uh, the very big picture of the Sino-American rivalry and we zoomed in on, on uh, what role the Nordics and maybe particularly Sweden has played and, and could play uh, on the Korean uh, peninsula, even though that is of course intimately linked to the bigger uh, picture. And I, I must say, I, I I mean, much, much of what you've said, I think, is probably common knowledge about the, the Nordic or, 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 or Sweden, Swedish role. But it's also, I, I learned new things. Uh, you know, uh, it's a myth that Pyongyang is not interested in dialogue. You are receiving North Korea scholars, and there is my, maybe somewhere where in some quarters a, a concern that things are not moving quickly enough. I could also easily see that uh, there might be dangers in moving moving uh, too quickly. But so thanks a lot for that, uh, for those reflections. So uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground and I'd like to open up for a, this time it's going to be short reflections from, from each of you. Uh, we, I mean, our topic today is the future security um, in the Nordic region and, and, and Korea. And it certainly has to do with the big picture of where Korea can uh, situate uh, itself uh, and whether it can maintain the strategic uh, ambiguity. It's the role of, of, the, of the European uh, countries and maybe particularly the, the uh, uh, Nordic ones. Uh, uh, can we build collective security mechanisms, risk reduction mechanisms, uh, and how can we quite concretely uh, work through and with the uh, think tanks and track two or track point five or whatever uh, formats to, to promote peaceful outcomes. So maybe if I start with you, uh, Professor Yun, uh, uh, coming back to you and in, in some, some quick uh, reflections, uh, I asked you about the, the uh, strategic ambiguity. I mean, is it really possible for Korea to 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 uh, maintain that in this current climate, and uh, if it were to take a, a stronger stance in either way, what are the risks, and what are the risks of of of, of you know uh, of, of of maintaining the the uh, strategic continuity? So, if you would like to start with some quick comments on that. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador Hol uh, Holgren. I think a strategy ambiguity is difficult to maintain at this uh, at the moment because uh, we with Trump we could say we cannot choose between the U.S. and China, but Biden start to say that you don't the allies shouldn't have to choose between the two just to you know express what they believe as a belief as, as a values. Then Korea's position is, I think, clear. We are liberal democracy. So in that sense, maybe on the security issues, like uh, 
you know, joint military exercise in the, in the Pacific regions, Korea may refrain from joining those kind of exercises. But when it goes to values like uh, Hong Kong or other human rights issues, I think uh, if Korea wants to be middle power, seriously, then I think we should speak up. Of course, there could be economic retaliation from China, but I think in that sense, to mitigate that, I think we should uh, build uh, uh, cooperation with other countries, uh, just to mm. not to stand out too mm. much. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that's very interesting. So you're essentially saying that uh, Korea should take a, a bit of a stronger stance on some of these issues you mentioned of, of, of principle, and that's maybe what's needed if you're really going to become a, a trust middle power and that immediately makes me think of uh, regional uh, and security and uh, institutions and and and, and mechanisms uh, collective security etc because it could be done multilaterally and Mats, i mean you have been thinking quite a lot about uh, that i mean do you see that uh, that's maybe a way forward and how could that actually happen because i mean this region is fraught with the lack of collective security mechanisms and regional institutions. Maybe that's a way forward for, for Korea if, uh, as Professor Yoon said, uh, uh, you know, defending and stepping up a little bit, a bit more for those values uh, that we as liberal democracies believe in. What, what do you think, Mats? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I do think it, it's at least it's a way forward to try. It, it's maybe you should put all your money on that, but but I mean we, we we do have a situation in 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 East Asia where there is a a there is some kind of security architecture. It's the bilateral defense alliances, and there are some few complementary uh, frameworks within the ASEAN, uh, for instance. But what I'm what I am trying to put to you um, as proposals is that. Maybe we need, or East Asia need more of complementary institutions platform, and the ones you have may not be ideal to tackle the current and future security challenge. And I make a reference to what we in in our region talk about when we address Arctic challenges. I mean, I think we have come to the conclusion that NATO is not the ideal partner to discuss Arctic challenges. And there has been a thriving um, for trying to promote and organize other kind of groupings and platforms and institutional frameworks to discuss Arctic challenges. And, and one is uh, the Joint Expeditionary Force, a, a UK-led initiative for Northern Europe that is, is, is uh, an open, um, Uh, Max, I cannot hear you right now. Yes. There's no sound, Max. Knowledge needed in order to address the current and future. So, by having complementary institutions and platforms, increase understanding. And maybe, and I'm also thinking in, in a very incremental fashion that, uh, and I think Nicholas mentioned that as, as being a little bureaucratic, being a bit slow, take step by step. And, and maybe this could also be a way of trying to take some of the heat of the South Korea and Japan relationship by embedding those countries in a different type of institutional framework where more nations can join 
Uh, and hopefully you can embed uh, North Korea in such a framework as well. Mm. So yes, I think you much. Uh, we're pursuing. Mm. Mm. Uh, Professor Yoon, and I'd also like to bring you in, Professor Kim, because you also spoke about uh, the challenges of being, uh, you know, in the court in the middle. I mean, do, do you think that uh, institutions, regional institutions, collective security, could somehow develop in this region uh, and being a little bit inspired by what Mats Engman just uh, just uh, said and which would they be in that case? What, what do you think, Professor Jürgen? Uh, I think that's very difficult to imagine at the moment. I think the current situation is also rather the opposite that like there is a, a US uh, efforts to, to try to expand the quad, which is a uh, 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 cooperation between US, Japan, uh, Australia, and uh, India. And then other countries in the region are asked to join, although quad uh, try to include, uh, you know, soft security issues. So I think uh, at the moment, uh, what, you know, as called the collective security architecture sounds very difficult, but I think we could mm. use more regional forums uh, in a more mm. soft, uh, you know, uh, diplomacy, I would say. Yeah. Mm. Soft diplomacy and regional forums. Professor Kim, you were also talking about these issues. Uh, it, it sounds almost as you said that uh, Korea should not take a side, should not choose side. It should really staunchly stand in, in the middle, but it's a lonely place sometimes. And, and uh, do you see any scope for, for, for collective security or regional security mechanisms uh, as far as you uh, can, uh, can see it, Professor Kim? Uh, I'm not arguing to, to be in the middle or to be a kind of balance between these two gigantic uh, countries. You know, uh, South Korea, US is a staunch ally and uh, the most important okay. you know, uh, uh, foreign policy and security uh, pillar. Mm. Uh, uh, but mm. uh, I, what I'm trying to say is the, uh, you know, there is a kind of uh, historical memories of uh, great powers. So uh, uh, no matter what kind of situation is, and uh, we should be very cautious in dealing with them. And uh, we should pay the kind of respect to them uh, in some sense. Mm -hmm. And then also there is a certain areas of uh, cultivating, you know, our own interest as well there. And uh, so that's why mm -hmm. I am uh, trying to tell uh, my uh, president and the uh, governments, be cautious, mm -hmm. uh, don't be, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, make any hastened you know, decision. Uh, this is the, my mm -hmm. uh, you know, advice. And in terms of a collective uh, you know, uh, cooperation or uh, you know, security mechanism in this region, mm -hmm. uh, I do not think it's going to be uh, formed you know, sooner or later because there is a lack of leadership. And uh, nobody uh, mm -hmm. will take a kind of leadership. And then also uh, mm -hmm. uh, India, for example, uh, try mm. to keep uh, its, uh, you know, scope, uh, a kind of space for their own autonomy and foreign policies as well. Uh, even though mm. they uh, uh, had a kind of a skirmishes uh, in uh, on the border uh, of, uh, you know, China and then uh, India uh, in these days, but and also uh, uh, Japan and even Australia has a kind of second thought in my view, and uh, they. A carefully watch over the domestic part of the United States, whether the uh, United States is able to continue their own current, you know, uh, China policies, uh, for how long and uh, how deep. Uh, this is the question. And then without that kind of, you know, uh, 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 credibility of US-China policies, it is extremely uh, difficult for the, uh, you know, local, uh, you know, countries to uh, take side. And then also the, we experienced the, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 some, uh, you know, problems with the United States uh, uh, in the event of the, in the accident of the, you know, sad, you know, uh, uh, issues. And then when China, uh, you know, had a very uh, aggressive uh, uh, pressure upon uh, South Korea because of the sad installation on, on the Korean soil, 
and but there is mm. no help from the, uh, the United States actually, mm. and also even yeah. Australia. And so mm. this is a kind of a self-help system. So uh, uh, in, in in facing the kind of self-help system, we should be very cautious. And then uh, uh. also telling the United States, uh, what can you do? What we can do together? And this is the very important. The United States give us a kind of a confidence uh, in that uh, uh, regard. Uh, without that, uh, all the countries will have a much more complicated, you know, uh, thought. Uh, even though on the surface they, uh, you know, showing a kind of, uh, you know, their own, uh, you know, uh, 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 declaratory policies, but uh, in uh, in reality, a uh, much more complicated. Uh, that's why, uh, you know. Uh, especially the uh, the situation of South Korea is quite different from that of uh, uh, Japan and then also the Australia. As I explained, the uh, you know the proportion of our trade and the proportion of yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and and uh, Professor Kim, I, I, th I mean I did not uh, uh, of course uh, try to allude that that uh, Korea was was trying in the, to be in in the middle, but it is a it is a it is a, it remains a kind of uh, maybe, as you just said, a more exposed position than, than Japan and other countries. And I, I'm just thinking about what do you make of the Indo-Pacific initiative? Because that's that's a new initiative that has come. And, and given that the uh, European countries have also provided leadership in that, and, and then, of course, we have what Nicholas talked about, the Nordic countries also taking initiatives from the, in the um, whatever, uh, six-party-ish uh, uh, formats here. Uh, do you see any new possibilities in, for instance, the Indo-Pacific uh, strategies? Because, I mean, you mentioned that Germany has been very cautious and there is, you know, uh, uh, there is actually an element of inclusivity there that I think is quite interesting. Uh, uh, and do you think that that might provide a platform which is useful for Korea as we go ahead? Um. I uh, carefully watch over the uh, you know, progress of the uh, you know in the Pacific initiatives and then uh, uh, because uh, Biden uh, announced the uh, you know they care about the middle class uh, you know uh, based mm -hmm. upon the uh, middle class uh, you know protection uh, they will do the foreign policies which means the, uh, they are very reluctant to join the uh, you know. Uh, CPTPP yeah, and uh, also some uh, you know, economic cooperation in the area. So uh, uh, this is a very uh, complicated uh, the uh, calculation of the all countries in the region and then also mm -hmm. the progress of uh, in the Pacific initiatives. But you will anyway mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, uh, have a certain progress and then also the, we are very interested in the joining the Indo-Pacific mm. you know, uh, initiatives oh. because of inclusiveness uh. and openness and also based upon the norm-based international order, we support all of them. Uh, so uh, uh, there will be the uh, uh, South Korea and the US summit meeting, uh, maybe uh, in a few days. And uh, South Korea, I, I believe South Korea uh, um, president will uh, you know, address uh, kind of his support for the, uh, you know, the kind of idea of uh, uh, you know, openness, inclusiveness of the uh, Pacific uh, initiative and the South Korea is uh, willing to, uh, uh, well, that's to join. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, very, that's very interesting. Let's see what we will probably see that on Saturday here in uh, this part of the world, what the conclusions of that uh, joint declaration are. And, and Niklas uh, Swanström, if I, if I revert to you, I mean, it's fascinating. You're talking about the role of the, the Nordic uh, think tanks. I mean, I know that for sure. I come from one of them, how actually in some, in some uh, periods, these have been quite catalytic and quite important, but also <laughs> the importance of managing the expectations of, 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 of that. I mean, uh, what, I mean, when you say that uh, uh, there are critiques that you might be moving too quickly, uh, why is that uh, a critique? And I mean, how can you manage those expectations? It's after all a quite slow moving uh, substance we're talking about, isn't it? And uh, as, as you said yourself, uh, the Nordics are just, uh, you know, small actors compared to the, the big you know, giants that, that we're talking about here. Well, Niklas. I mean, yeah, the, the argument was really that, I mean, the, yeah, the Nordics are moving too slow. Um, the, the, the North and South Koreans see an opportunity and they want to move in very quickly and engage 
quickly because uh, this is the time to resolve everything. And, you know, they come in with a high spirit, move quickly. And sometimes the, uh, you know, of course, the political commitment, the financial resources and all that is not really in place for from our side. But I think that also is sometimes good because when you move into a dialogue like that or with high expectations, the drop is really high when it doesn't really come into reality. So, so this is something I think we constantly need to do is to maintain the momentum, but keep the momentum at a level that we can deliver. And also that the, the both Pyongyang, Seoul, Washington, Beijing also can deliver. So I think a slow and steady process is really, really useful. And I think that's really where we, we are, I, I think, manager of expectations. I think a lot of times th that's really what we need to be because um, they, it goes from black to white, but the reality is in many times just gray. And we just need to make sure that as long as we move to a lighter form of gray, that's good enough right now. But actually, I want to just mention the, the uh, sort of multilateral cooperation. I mean, we have three major conflicts, the Korean Peninsula, the, Ty the, 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 the Taiwan Straits, and the Sino-US conflict. Those are the only three we cannot really engage in a multilateral context because the actors don't allow it. China refuses to recognize Taiwan. US and China doesn't want any other actors to engage and, and influence their conflict. And Pyongyang is terrified over the prospect of having a multilateral coalition against them. So when we're looking at this, I think we need to focus on low hanging fruits. Uh, we need to focus on things that are we can manage. Uh, environment, I mean, things that we all benefit from without really sort of touching, because I think we're far away from a, you can imagine ASEAN plus five, and I agree with Professor Kim here, there's no leader in Northeast Asia, but you, well, if you bring in ASEAN, maybe they can take the lead. Yes, they could, but we still can't touch those three conflicts. So we can create the regional grouping that is functional but not where it's needed. So we, you know, this is a very, very problematic situation. I still think we should create some sort of structure that could deal with them, you know, softer issues and then aim for, you know, long-term security engagement. But I think we have to be very patient for that to happen because the, the timing is not right right now, unfortunately. I hate being a pessimist. No, <laughs> no, 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 thank you, Nicholas. I, I see that time is, is running. Uh, uh, so thank you for those uh, reflections. I'd like to, to wrap uh, uh, this up. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious that we have a couple of uh, extremely complicated and longstanding uh, conflicts uh, of, of a major character, as you, as you just uh, mentioned. Uh, and where actors will not maybe even allow outsiders to come in. But I think this discussion also, also illustrated the need for all actors to, to engage. And I can think kind of outside of the box. Uh, Korea has an interest to engage with the EU, European countries, the Nordic countries. We have a bit of a duty to identify areas of cooperation because you, I mean, in, in international relations, you think, uh, you, you, ne you never know. I mean, uh, uh, surprises uh, might happen. And, and, and in the meanwhile, we need to, you know, defend and, 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 and you know, stand up for, for those uh, values that we believe in while, while trying to identify areas where we can find common ground. And, and that's where I, at least I have seen how, how the Nordics can, uh, to some extent, in the Bardin contribute, and how there is a, a curiosity from, from, uh, and maybe even a need uh, in, in 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 Korea to engage with with others as, as well. So, uh, while I think we we haven't solved uh, any of these quite big challenges in our discussion today, but uh, 
I really, I learned a lot. Thank you, thank you for for sharing your perspectives. And I, I can only um, encourage uh, ISTP and the Korea University uh, Nordic uh, Center to continue uh, these uh, discussions and uh, hopefully soon in in Seoul or, or or in Stockholm where we can continue to identify areas of of, of collaboration. Uh, I, I, it's it's badly needed, and I'm sure we can learn things from each other. So uh, with this, I'd, I'd like to thank thank you all, Professor Ewan, Professor Kane, Mats Engman, Niklas Swanström for for contributing to this uh, debate. And I will hand it over, I believe, to Mr. Sangsoli. So thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now closing yeah. this session, first session, and uh, we will start the, the second session at 10.40 in Stockholm and 5.40 in Seoul. And please, uh, speakers for the first session, uh, log out once, uh, but we you can still access, uh, you can listen the second session with uh, the, our public link you can find on our webpage. So thank you very much. Thank you. See you soon. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, wonderful moderator. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot.